Okay, so if you want to approximate the square root of x squared plus y squared, it turns out that 0.96x plus 0.4y is actually a very good approximation. And here we're saying that x is bigger than y and they're both positive, but you can imagine if y was bigger than x, you could just swap your x and y in the formula, and if either of them was negative, then you could just replace them with modulus signs. So with a small tweak, this really does work for all values of x and y. Now this figure of a 4% error seems far too good to me. Just intuitively looking at this, this 0.96x plus 0.4y doesn't seem particularly closely related to our original expression. So intuitively I wouldn't have said that we have such a good percentage error here. So what we'll do is we'll prove this using a method using calculus, and then there's also a nice geometric interpretation for this fact that we'll look at at the end. So what we need to prove is basically that our approximation 0.96x plus 0.4y if you divide this by the thing that we're trying to approximate, root x squared plus y squared, we want this to be between 0.96 and 1.04, so we're within 4% of this being just equal to 1. And how will we prove this? Well, first of all, we'll tidy this up a bit by dividing through by y. So 0.96 times x over y plus 0.4, all divided by, in the denominator, we get x over y all squared plus 1. Now if y was equal to 0, we can't divide through by y, but fortunately when y is 0, this whole thing is just 0.96x over root x squared, which is just equal to 0.96, and this is in our interval. So we're done when y is 0. So if y is not equal to 0, we can divide through by y and get this nice expression. And the reason this is helpful is, if you imagine now we introduce u is equal to x over y, then you'll notice here because x is greater than or equal to y, u is now greater than or equal to 1. So actually all we could do is show that, let's call this f of u is 0.96u plus 0.4 divided by root u squared plus 1. All we want to show now is that f of u is between 0.96 and 1.04 for all u greater than or equal to 1. Now it makes sense to look for turning points of f now. So if we just differentiate, we'll find that f prime of u using the quotient rule will get 0.96 times root u squared plus 1, then take away 0.96u plus 0.4. Then when we differentiate the term in the denominator, we'll get 2u times a half from the power, so just times u, and then we've got u squared plus 1 to the power of minus a half. Then all of this gets divided by the denominator squared, so just by u squared plus 1 now. We can tidy this up a bit by multiplying the top and bottom by root u squared plus 1, so you get 0.96 times u squared plus 1 minus 0.96u plus 0.64 times u, and then this term just disappears when we multiply by root u squared plus 1, and our denominator term is now u squared plus 1 to the power of 3 over 2. And this is really nice because here we can actually simplify a bit more. You'll see your 0.96u squared cancels out with minus 0.96u times u. So these two terms can be removed and then we get a nice expression here. 0.96 times 1 minus 0.4u all divided by u squared plus 1 to the power of 3 over 2. So we're interested in turning points. So when is this equal to 0? Well you can just see by inspection here that f dash of u is equal to 0 happens when the numerator is equal to 0, so when u is equal to 0.96 over 0.4, you can check that this happens when u is equal to 2.4. So now we could have a look at this whether it's a maximum or a minimum point using the second derivative. There's actually a nicer way of doing this just by inspection here. You can see that the denominator term is always going to be positive, so whether the first derivative is positive or negative just depends on this nice linear term on top. So you can just see here, if you put in a slightly smaller value of u, then you'll get an increasing function. So the value of u between 1 and 2.4, your first derivative is going to be positive when u is less than 2.4. And similarly, if you put in a slightly larger value of u, you're going to get a negative derivative. So whenever u is greater than 2.4, we'll get the first derivative. It's negative. So now this tells us a lot about what the graph of the function is going to look like. If we try and draw a sketch now of f of u, we start off when u is equal to 1. So if you substitute in u equals 1 into our expression, you'll get about 0.962, which is in this interval that we like. So we want to be greater than 0.96. We start off with certainly greater than this, 
and we're well below 1.04. So we start off when u is 1, we're at 0.962, and we know now that the function increases from u equals 1 all the way along to u equals 2.4, where we have a maximum point. If you plug in u equals 2.4 into our function, we actually get f of u is 1.04. So we increase up from 0.962 to a maximum point at 1.04, and from there we decrease. So the problem here is we don't actually know whether or not we're going to go below 0.96. So what we need to look at here really is the behavior as u goes to infinity. So the limit as u goes to infinity of f of u, what we'll do here is just divide through the top and bottom of our fraction by u, so we get 0.96 plus 0.4 over u, and all of this divided by the square root of 1 plus 1 over u squared. So you can see here as u goes to infinity and the numerator, this term disappears, and this term goes to zero as well in the denominator, so we're just left with 0.96. And this is actually really useful because we know that we approach this limit from above 0.96, because if we were to go below an approach from below, that would mean that our function is increasing. We'd also need another turning point there, which we know that we can't have from what we know about the first derivative. So this tells us then that our function f of u, it starts off above 0.96, it goes up to 1.04, and then it stays always above 0.96, never quite reaching it as u gets bigger and bigger. So we can conclude then that f of u is indeed between 0.96 and 1.04 for all u greater than or equal to 1. And this means that we've proven that our original approximation is always within 4% of x squared plus y squared square root. And this is really nice because we actually achieve both of these bounds as well. We get 1.04 when u is 2.4, so basically when x over y is equal to 2.4, we're exactly 4% above what we need to be. And also we achieve this 0.96. If you remember when y was equal to 0, we got 0.96. And this kind of corresponds to the case where u is infinity here, dividing by 0. And now for a geometric interpretation of this result, we can do a little bit of rescaling again just to make this easier. So if we divide through the top and bottom by the square root of x squared plus y squared, we'll get 0.4y over root x squared plus y squared. And then in the bottom, even though you can see this is perhaps going to be 1, we'll write this as the square root of x over root x squared plus y squared, all of this squared, plus y over root x squared plus y squared, all of this squared. So why have we done this? Well, this is really useful because now you could actually replace your x and y. We're essentially renormalizing here. So replace x by x over root x squared plus y squared. Replace your y by y over root x squared plus y squared. So we've just normalized these so that x squared plus y squared is equal to 1, so that we lie on the unit circle here. So we can actually say, without any loss of generality then, x squared plus y squared is equal to 1, so we lie on a unit circle. And because we've got x bigger than y bigger than 0, we're actually just on an eighth of the unit circle here. So we're always just going to be interested in this arc of the unit circle here between these different points. So how does this relate to our approximation 0.96x plus 0.4y? Well, you could have a look at each different point along this arc. 0.96x plus 0.4y will take different values. And you can think of this as equivalent to moving a straight line around. So if we take the line with equation 0.96x plus 0.4y is equal to some constant c, you can think of this like in linear optimization where you move your line up and down by changing the value of c here. What we'll essentially get is by changing the value of c, we'll have lots of different parallel lines. So we're interested now in, if we take these different parallel lines, what's the biggest possible value of c we can get, and what's the smallest possible value of c we can get where we still go through this arc, this eighth of the circle here. And you'll see that you'll get your largest and smallest values at either of the endpoints, or potentially at this point where our line is tangent to the circle. So we just need to check the following points, where x, y, for this endpoint here, this is just root 2 over 2 root 2 over 2. So we need to find the value of c and check this. So this could potentially be the maximum or the minimum depending on how steep these lines are in my drawing. And then for this point where we're tangent, if you do the calculations you can check that 0.96x plus 0.4y equals c is tangent, actually at the point where x is 5 over 13 
and y is 12 over 13, which is really nice because there we've got a scaled down Pythagorean triple. I think it's really interesting. And finally, we need to check this endpoint here. So this just has coordinates x is 1 and y is 0. So in this example, you can follow through now all of the calculations and you'll see that you get the smallest value of c at 1, 0. So this is where c is 0 0.96 and the largest value of c will be at this point 5 over 13, 12 over 13, and we'll get 1.04 for our value of c. So this is a really nice way of seeing this, that because an eighth of a circle is not too far off being a straight line, as we move our line up and down, we don't actually need to change the value of c too much here. So this is a bit of a geometric intuition into why we get such a good approximation. And what's really interesting as well is this choice of 0.96 and 0.4 isn't even optimal. It's close to being optimal, and these are really nice numbers to work with, but you could tweak these slightly and get just under a 4% error.